we'll look at Renesa, Renesa art and artists today. Renesa art uh, of Europe particularly. So Renesa began in Europe in 12th, 13th century as a beginning, but it flourishes in 14th and 15th century and moves into 16th century where Renesa is nothing but it is the rebirth. What is Renesa? Renesa is rebirth and rebirth of what? Rebirth of Greek classical age in spirit, in arts, in philosophy, in culture. So it is basically the rebirth of classical Greece and classical Rome of Europe. So why did Renesa happen? Renesa happened because of various uh, changes that happened in the society in the 12th, 13th century, you know. But Renesa, so 12th century, 13th century is a sort of a movement towards Renesa. It was not Renesa as yet, but it was a kind of a proto-Renesa period. But in the 13th century to 14th century, we see like 14th, particularly 14th century, is the time when Renaissance flourishes. And Renaissance is <clears throat> centered on humanism, basically. So the human, and which is very important for us to un keep in mind that the human becomes the center, center of the world, and the center of the imagination, uh, cultural imagination, social imagination, and also the religious imagination. So humanism is the philosophy that guides Renaissance efforts, Renaissance imagination. So human being becomes the center of the world. So people started looking at the world, understanding the world from the eyes of the human being, from the position of the human being. Right? So that is the basic philosophy, main philosophy uh, of Renaissance. But this philosophy was again sort of inspired from the greek or roman uh, you know philosophical understanding of human uh, and the philosophical understanding of the society of the time so and it is also it also coincides with uh, various kinds of scientific innovations and renaissance also led to new approaches to science and new innovations so renaissance was a sort of a revolution uh, within the society in the sense that it's, it kind of changed the way uh, the society organized itself. So uh, when it comes to the political structure of Renaissance, it was not aristocratic as such, but it, was, it operated in the structure of city-states, where a city becomes the center and the city and the powerful uh, representatives of the city would rule the entire territory comprised of city as well as villages. So, and uh, it was largely influenced by the powerful and wealthy families. So these are basically the merchant families or the wealthy families who were also operating as banking families. So they were also lending money to the rulers uh, as well as to the businessmen, to the merchants. So these wealthy families really were very influential both politically as well as socially and this influence also reflected in the culture, in the cultural efforts, in the cultural patronage and within that cultural patronage where they patronized philosophy, uh, uh, translations of Greek, Greek Roman philosophical books, uh, they uh, patronized poets and writers, at the same time they extensively patronized the artists. So, at this point of time, it was not the aristocratic patronage that the artist got, but these, uh, the patronage of the wealthy families. Along with the wealthy families, we also have patronage coming from the merchant families, you know, from the merchants. So the city-states were very competitive and there were wars between the city-states, like between different city-states, there were, there were wars and there was competition of, of uh, business, uh, of commerce, of culture also. So these families, these wealthy people competed also in terms of culture, in terms of who is patronizing which artists. So they also uh, determined and recognized the great artists, right? So Venice, Florence and Milan were very important cities along with Rome. So Ro these were prominent cities and Florence 
was a republic uh, republic it, it operated on the republic system of politics it was not aristocratic where the republic system is represented uh, it operates on the representation of a senate you have different people forming the government rather than a, one person who is a king is ordering or who is ruling the city or ruling the region but here the republic system with the democratic ideals so florence admired this the democratic ideals and we know that the the basic democratic form of governance existed in the times of classical greece so we can see where the political form that for them was coming from so it was coming from the greek classical period so these four cities are also important for the uh, context of the evolution of renaissance art and architecture as well as sculpture so both painting and sculpture as well as architecture so all these got flourished during the renaissance from let us say 15th century to 16th century that was the moment where it got flourished so it was a self conscious effort like unlike earlier movements uh, uh, of western art that may be gothic romanesque you can go into different move moments of art in the history uh, byzantine art or different moments of art charlemagne uh, carolingian art uh, so this particular movement was a conscious movement self conscious movement and they knew what they were doing and they were they were doing to achieve something right so they they were very clear about what they wanted to achieve so this clarity and rationality is very important when it comes to understanding renaissance and renaissance art so let us quote petrarch someone who belonged to this time period petrarch was a scholar so he wrote i quote when the darkness breaks the generations to come may contrive to find their way back to the clear splendor of the ancient past so he is clearly hinting at the the splendor of the ancient past which is the greek classical past so when the darkness breaks so that means they imagined that the dark time so we know that after the end of the rome and from to the beginning of renaissance that time period was called as dark ages so it he's hinting at that moment of dark ages and once that breaks the people are looking back to the light to the splendor of the ancient greece so we know with this quote we know that how they were very much venerating the kind of uh, achievements of classical greece so artworks were done on walls and ceilings and church of churches public buildings and private dwellings so here unlike the earlier times where artworks were largely done in the churches uh, uh, with religious themes particularly christian themes here you have artworks being done in public buildings uh, private houses private dwellings along with churches and uh, also one another important thing here is because of the humanist philosophy here the and also because of the greco roman uh, influence of visual representation we have here the language of classical greece the visual language of classical greece uh, the classical perfection of human figure comes to uh, representing renaissance art also so they are representing the christian themes the biblical themes but in the visual form in the visual language which is very much closer to the classical greece but classical greece did not represent christian themes it represented pagan themes what uh, the religion that existed during the uh, greek times uh, uh, was pagan religion so the, they were representing pagan gods and goddesses and pagan themes so the pagan language the pagan visual language was adopted by the renaissance artists but the but for the christian faith right so that is an interesting combination when we look at renaissance uh, art uh, uh, both painting as well as sculpture also we can see in architecture where the roman uh, as well as the greek architectural elements were reinvented were reused in a new context so accumulation of wealth 
actually why this expansion happened is because of the accumulation of wealth which resulted in employing new artists or commissioning artists, musicians and scholars and it also led to elaborate building activity. So it is not a matter of going back but it is also the accumulation of wealth at this point of time. So another important thing one needs to keep in mind is in 1347 there was something called a black death. So people 50% or more of Europe uh, was wiped out, people died because of the Black Death which was like plague was spreading. So after the Black Death and Renaissance is also needed to understood uh, in this context where after the Black Death you have and Florence was badly affected. So after the Black Death you have people started thinking about what is life and how to understand life in more deeper level and uh, how to uh, enjoy life, how to live life in a more meaningful and in, in a more enjoyable manner. So there it, it kind of gave a sort of a new perspective or at least an impetus to new perspective in approaching life. So that is an important moment. Then after that you have Florence really grow, it really grew uh, economically as well as in terms artistically. So, Along uh, uh, at this time, we also have certain other important features that needs to keep in mind. That is printing technology. So, along with other technologies, uh, scientific innovations, printing technology is something that got innovated at this point of time. And because of the printing technology got in, uh, invented, you have books being published, right? So, unlike before, where books were handwritten, now books could be. Uh, reproduced in many numbers and very quickly. So this led to the spread of education. This led to the increase of number of people who could read, right? So spread of knowledge and the expansion of reading culture. So that is an important feature uh, which n where knowledge, you know, knowledge is one of the important preoccupations of Renaissance and spreading knowledge with printing technology is a very important dimension to that. Uh, to, to, to Renaissance. Another is the shift from a theological understanding of life to a scientific understanding of life. Before that people used to think in terms of theology, in terms of religion. Life used to be understood, everything in life used to be understood as if given by the God. It is determined by the God. But now people started questioning questioning those beliefs, the earlier beliefs. So instead of believing in magic, people began to use scientific experimentation and careful observation to learn how the real world worked. So before that, people thought that God is one who is making the world uh, move and work the way it works. But now people started questioning that and started observing, experimenting, with things in the world to understand it better. So scientific experimentation is very important when it comes to Renaissance from where it, many scientific innovations started like printing press, like uh, Galileo's uh, invention of telescope and understanding of globe, uh, the, the understanding of earth moving around sun rather than sun moving around earth. So all these new approaches to universe, new approaches to understanding the life and other aspects of the world around. So, so new knowledge came to the light. So this is a very important when it comes to Renaissance. And another thing is the age of exploration. So they, because they wanted to know more, this urge for knowledge was there, they moved away from their own centers from their from Europe. So they moved to different other territories. For example, Christopher Columbus, you know, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and he happened to discover America, right? So 1492, he sailed the entire Atlantic to kind of bump into this uh, place called place later called America. And you have Vasco de Gama, uh, you know, found a route from Spain to the east and you know he comes to Goa, right? So they, many, many other sailors later and you have sailing institutes, you know, navigation institutes were set up at that point of time. So you have navigation techniques taught and uh, you know 
uh, trained, people were trained. So you have many explorers started moving away from Europe and in the urge to know other places. And later from there you have something called colonialism, what we later call colonialism started with this urge to explore and know. And then they started exploiting these other places, which is a different story. But it begins with this urge to know the world around. So let us move into the art. Let, let us move uh, by looking at, uh, you know, let us start looking at the images, the paintings. So when it comes to Renaissance and painting, someone called Giotto is very important. He's, the, he's considered to be the father of Renaissance. Uh, painting because he invented certain techniques of representation which sort of were not there before that. So a certain sense of naturalism he introduced to painting uh, which was not there before. So naturalism as well as the human quality. You know. So Giotto uh, and uh, he painted this chapel, Arena Chapel in Padua uh, in Italy. So he was commissioned uh, and in uh, the early 14th century. So he painted the entire interior of the chapel with the themes of Christ, with the biblical themes, the life stories of Christ. So uh, if you look at these paintings, like the image that you see, uh, it, the human figure, as we were talking about, the human figure acquires the centrality here and the human emotion. If you look at the people who are lamenting, and this is called lamentation, when the Christ, the body of the Christ is brought down from the, Christ, uh, from the cross, and the people are, Mary and uh, other people are sort of, you know, attending the uh, body of the Christ. So if you look at the composition, the composition is very calculated, okay. Unlike the earlier, uh, you know, Gothic, uh, painting or the earlier paintings which were largely illuminations, which were largely manuscripts. And there was Byzantine painting and Byzantine icon painting and murals which did not have a naturalistic appeal to them. And what is naturalistic appeal? What is this sense of naturalism? Naturalism is something when you look at the painting or an image, you get to feel you know, as if the people are real, as if you know, that is how people appear outside when you look, you know, so almost na natural, nature-like, you know, the way the people appear in the nature outside. So the same kind of effect, the same kind of feeling you get when you look at the painting. So for example, if you look at this painting uh, by Giotto, or Lamentation, where it is a moment of agony, it is a moment of sadness, and you can see on the faces of these people, they look very sad. and the composition, if you look at the composition, all the figures are bent and all the attention of the figures are directed towards the Christ, you know, and the Christ uh, has a halo around his head as well as uh, Mary, uh, the mother of the Christ. So you have halo for both of them and the, all the attention, so you, you see the figure on the bottom left who is who, who, whose back is shown to us, who is, who is making a sort of an arc like that. And you have other two figures on the right side in the center. They are also sort of making a sort of carves, arcs like that, which are kind of making our eye move towards the center, that which is the uh, Christ, I mean, uh, towards, he's becoming the center here. And you, you go back and you look at the, cliff, you look at the mountain and the diagonal, it is, it is made in the diagonal and the diagonal is sort of making our attention to come down there and all the angels are very interestingly sort of represented in different, different perspectives, you know, different angles. They are also in agony, they are also in sadness. So it is not only about the story, but the representation of the story is more emotionally loaded, which is again a human quality, right? So it is very interesting to see how Giotto introduced this emotion into the painting. So if you look at this painting by Giotto again, which is not in the landscape, but which is inside a room, right? And the room is very interest, interestingly composed, right? So you have a small room, which looks like as if it is a wooden house, 
but the spaces are interestingly composed and architecture is used to create a sense of naturalistic space, right? So, uh, unlike earlier painting, so if you want to understand this, you need to have an understanding of what happened before Giotto. What happened before Giotto was we did not have the effort of creating this naturalistic ambience. Here, Giotto has, has started it with the help of architecture to begin with. So architecture here is uh, being used as a technique, as a sort of a mechanism to separate the ambiences, separate the spaces. How is it happening here? So it is a small room where uh, an angel is coming from the window, right? So outside in the background, you have a blue background which looks like sky. And this in the inside, which looks like a sort of a bedroom, uh, you have Mary kneeling and angel is coming and announcing her and this is called Annunciation. Announcing that you will be giving birth to a child before your marriage, right? So Virgin Mary listens to it and how, so this interior and very interestingly that small window is used from where the angel is trying to enter and disclosing this. Right? And you have an attendant figure right outside. So this outside and inside is played very interestingly. And there are very interesting details, you know, for example, the folded bed and the other sort of details, the, uh, the curtain uh, that you have over there. And it is not very naturalistic, but there is this attempt of naturalism. And another interesting and important feature about Giotto is if you look at the figures, the figures are really sculpture-like, they are really solid, they are really voluminous and there is this sense of gravity, there is this uh, sense of people are really standing or sitting on the ground and the modeling of the figure is very strong, they look as if they are like sculpturesque, sculpture-like. So this is an example how Giotto has employed uh, architecture, architecture as a motif and how he is dividing the space using this architecture and within that mechanism you have, you know, angel is coming from the window and she is coming from outside and entering inside. So the outside inside is created very interestingly, you know, the feel of outside and inside. And in the same kind of a composition, if you look at this painting, uh, in the same kind of a composition and this is the birth of Christ. So the Christ is already born and but this is again happening inside this room, right? So this room also belong, it looks like this room belongs to a sort of a lower class. It is not, it, when you look at this and the people and the ambience and you know the bedroom and you know the bed sheets and other things if you look at it appears as if uh, the house belongs to a sort of a lower class um, person and you know Joseph was a carpenter so very uh, it it is obvious that he belonged to a lower class uh, category of the society so yeah so you have uh, the reputation of the figure of the Christ here you know so where the figure of the Christ is held by uh, one person uh, in the top and in the bottom you have uh, he's been uh, bathed or cleaned. So this reputation, the logic of reputation is something that continues from the medieval painting, right? So it is called continuous narrative. So the same motif or so same figure gets repeated or represented twice or thrice to suggest the progression of narrative. For, for example, from the moment of birth to the moment of cleaning maybe. So there are two moments where Christ is involved, right? So this is called continuous narrative. And you have one person trying to enter the house or he sort of came to visit, uh, so he visit, he's visiting to sort of maybe see the Christ, right? So you have a sort of an animated sense here where there is and outside, something is happening outside and somebody is want to visit and see the newly born child. So how he is sort of using an interesting way, uh, the architecture, to create this outside and inside uh, uh, experience and sensation. So after Giotto, and we can see more and more examples like this, um, 
which is uh, and try to understand more and more uh, how Renaissance becomes more complex later. Uh, so after uh, Giotto, we have a set of artists who belong to early Renaissance. So Giotto forms this sort of a bridge, a transition from the medieval painting to uh, the Renaissance. So right. So after that, you have few artists who actually have expanded and experimented the field of painting, right? And Masaccio, Masaccio is an important artist who died early, but he experimented with, uh, with techniques of painting and he enlarged the scope of painting and he created certain sensations within the painting. And Donatello, Donatello was a sculptor who, who again uh, created sculpture very differently, very expressive sculpture he had uh, produced. And you have Botticelli, Frangelico, and Piero della Francesca. So these are few artists who belong to the uh, early Renaissance, right? So this is early Renaissance. We can see, uh, you know, we can sort of date it to 15th century, that is 1400s. So a patron, a person who financially supports the artist. So the patron becomes a very important person, as we sort of discussed earlier, and who sort of uh, patronized each and every artist here. So this is Masaccio, when you look at the painting. This is Masaccio and it is called uh, Trinity, right? the Holy Trinity painted in uh, 1425. And uh, all these paintings were basically frescoes to, to keep in mind. They painted fresco, so they were all in the, on the wall inside the church or refractory or inside the chapels or palaces, wherever. So all these were frescoes, right? So if you look at this painting, this is Holy Trinity, but uh, uh, it is the representation of crucifixion, you know. Uh, Christ is on cross, but if you uh, uh, look at the way Christ is represented, right behind the Christ you have the figure of the God, right? So which is why it is Holy Trinity. And you have the bottom, uh, you have two figures attendants who were basically the patrons, right? So if you look at the composition, you know, it is composed in a sort of a niche, right? And with round arch and round arch again is an arch that is coming from the Rome. It is also called as Roman arch. So it is coming from the Roman architecture and the pillar stars that are there, the pillar stars and the architectural motifs with the, uh, with the, with the capital, the Corinthian capital, and all the other details, you see it is reflecting the Roman architecture, right? And if you look at the back side of Christ, you have uh, the roof is uh, divided into this squarish texture, you know, these, these uh, incisions, and it takes you inside, right? So all these lines that are kind of going in and taking us in, they, they actually go meet at the point where his legs are, the feet of the Christ. So it is called vanishing point, right? And Masaccio is the first person who uses the perspective, the mathematical perspective. By then, mathematical perspective was not established. These were just experimentations, right? He was trying to experiment with the idea of perspective, which is the monoocular perspective. <clears throat> monoocular perspective means one eye perspective, right? Monoocular. Biocular is two eyes. Monoocular is one eye. So this monoocular perspective could be seen employed in this. And this is one of the first and very important paintings where you see the suggestion of light and shade, the suggestion of drama and emotion is very much embedded into it. So you can also see again architecture, you know, it is painting, but architecture is used to open the space, to kind of construct the space for the painting. And this is something that continues in the entire early Renaissance, usage of architecture to construct the ambience, to construct the space, to create a naturalistic ambience. And yeah, so this is another painting by Masaccio the 
who, the tribute money. When, <clears throat> when Christ enters Egypt and he was held by a money collector, the tax collector, right? So Christ and his apostles were, vis were entering and he, they were held uh, by the tax collector. So you can see the tax collector uh, in the center whose back is towards us. And Christ in the center is directing St. Peter to, go, to give him money. And they don't have money, but Christ knew where the money was. So Christ <clears throat> asked St. Peter to go to the lake, which is right at the back. Uh, and there's a fish, and inside the mouth of the fish, you get a coin. So St. Peter goes and gets that coin, and you can see he's handing over that coin to the tax collector on the right side. So even this is a continuous narrative. This is a, medi uh, a continuation of the medieval practice of continuous narrative, right? So you have two, one figure represented twice, both St. Peter's as well as the tax collector. So uh, you have an architectural motif uh, at the right side and you have a sort of a landscape at the background which suggests that they are sort of coming from outside the village to inside the village. So they are getting into the Egypt, Egyptian uh, territory. So uh, this is a suggestion from this landscape to the constructed, uh, the architectural space. And uh, yeah, if you look at the light and shade, it is not very dramatic, but the light and shade is used to kind of model the figures. And the figures and the way the garments, the drapery is very solid, they are very heavy and it has certain gravity, the sense of volume and solidity. And Masaccio is the first artist who has sort of introduced this volume, light and shade, chiaroscuro, which is called chiaroscuro, light and shade, and using this he created emotion. If you look at this painting, uh, Adam and Eve, I mean, the expulsion of Adam and Eve. You know Adam and Eve were expelled from the heaven, uh, from the Eden, uh, so that because they have, they, they, they have done a sin, right? So this is the moment of expulsion where uh, the angel is, you know, pushing them out, you know. Uh, so if you look at it, the light is quite dramatic. The light is coming from the right side and uh, it is litting up the bodies and the bodies, uh, you know, the nude bodies, they uh, show a relation with the Greek or Roman classical nude bodies, right? The kind of musculature, the kind of physiognomy that you see. And the light is making them more and more dramatic. And interestingly, the intense emotion, which is very rare, which is Gietto, we can see a little amount of emotion, but here the emotion is dramatized. Right? If you look at the faces and the kind of agony that they are uh, going through, so it is very intense. And you know, till then, emotion was not represented in the Christian themes. Till the Renaissance, in the medieval themes from the late Roman, from the beginning of Christian, early Christian art to the late Byzantine, emotion was never represented in the Christian themes because it was always relegated to the heavenly sort of zone where human emotions did not exist. But during Renaissance, it is emotion that comes to the painting, the human, the, the, the human quality. Uh, even the <clears throat> Christ or Christian themes are treated with this emotion. So humanization of Christ happens. That is very interesting where the Christian themes, you know, uh, are humanized, are ascribed with the human emotions of agony, happiness, you know, pain and longing and different kinds of emotions. If you look at this painting, St. Peter healing the sick with his shadow. So there are many miracles and many, many things that uh, happened. And this is one where St. Peter, as he walked across, as, as he was walking in the street, because of his shadow, when the shadow fell on these sick people, they became healthy and these are miracles. So this is one of the examples and you look at the street over there, the sick people sitting and then the people are watching him and look at the architecture and the kind of architecture that existed at that point of time, the architecture of the street. And uh, which is, uh, which also 
kind of helps us to understand and locate how, what kind of ambience, what kind of street and what kind of uh, street culture existed during uh, that time. And as you can see, St. Peter is wearing a robe and the treatment of the robe is very strong. It's very, you know, he's treated with the sense of light and shade and it is treated with the sense of volume and you have the followers uh, following him, right? Uh, but he, uh, uh, as a saint, St. Peter, he is not very much bothered or he doesn't know if actually he is healing. Maybe he knew but he doesn't reflect on his face because he's very stoic. He's looking very stoic and just moving forward, right? So he does not, he's not doing it actively on his own but his shadow itself is doing, the power of his shadow. So this is a sort of a miracle, an example of miracle and you have many of such <clears throat> miracles were shown, were, were painted by Masaccio, <clears throat> particularly in um, Santa, Santa Saria Novella, you know, which is in Florence. So Masaccio was one of the first artists of Florence um, who died early, I mean, at, nine, uh, at 28 years, I mean, at the age of 28 uh, because of illness. But had he lived for a longer time, we could see that he would have really um, influenced the entire Renaissance art differently. Now, if you look at the sculpture, Donatello becomes an important sculptor. Donatello is one of the uh, uh, prominent sculptors after, let us say, Ghiberti. Uh, uh, so, look at this sculpture which is called David and this sculpture is nude and this freestanding nude is done almost after 1000 years. Before this, you have nude standing sculptures we have seen in the context of classical Greece and Rome. And after the fall of Rome, we do not, we do not have uh, the nude standing sculptures or the nude sculptures at all. So Donatello, again, with that inspiration from the Greek classical and uh, Roman sculpture, well, he is bringing back that legacy. And this is the first uh, nude sculpture that we see after almost thousand years, right? <clears throat> so why, why could he do this? Because church was uh, less restrictive. There was like sort of a flexibility and church allowed uh, artists to kind of depict nudes. But these nudes have to be belonging to some kind of a mythology uh, or epic. Uh, okay, so it depicts David slaying Goliath. So this is a story where David kills Goliath when Goliath was killing an army, you know. So uh, David was asked, David was called and he uh, was uh, asked to take care of Goliath. So. David finally kills Goliath and this is the moment, if you look at the figure, the figure, the sculpture is standing in contraposto. What is contraposto? Contraposto is a posture where a figure stands on one leg and one leg is relaxed. As you can see in this sculpture, he is standing by drawing the entire weight on his right leg, where his left leg is relaxed. And we see this contraposto pose from the early Greek sculpture, after the archaic, from the beginning of the uh, uh, classical sculpture onwards, we see contraposto is being extensively used and explored. So he's using the same contraposto, and but if you look at the physiognomy of the sculpture, the body type, the character of the body, the character of the musculature, this character is very different from what we see in the Greek classical and Roman sculpture. This is a young teenage boy, he is not men, man, where, where in Greek classical sculpture we see these men represented with huge muscles, you know. But here you see uh, he is not represented with that expressive musculature, but this is something, the beginning, you know. So this is a sort of a, you know, symbol of promise. This is something that is coming, uh, this tells us that, you know, something is going to come. It is like giving a promise of a great future of art, so great future of Florence. So the David becomes a symbol of Florence and David becomes uh, the symbol of uh, 
uh, symbol of future and the new spirit that Renesa proclaimed. So another, uh, another sculpture by uh, Donatello. This is, uh, <clears throat> so these uh, sculptures were commissioned not by, you know, not by uh, kings or not by aristocratic class always. So these sculptures were commissioned by different guilds, you know, cotton drapers guild or linen drapers guild or, you know, uh, other kind of merchant classes, you know, and their guilds and cotton and textile uh, merchant guilds. So cotton, linen and textile merchant guilds, these were very prominent in, in patronizing. So uh, these were uh, uh, guilds, different kinds of guilds uh, of different merchants. They were very influential in uh, patronizing, in commissioning artists uh, to make paintings as well as sculptures. And this, is, uh, this particular sculpture is patronized by a linen drapers guild. <coughs> And these guilds were very influential in terms of the economy and commerce and there were competitions and they had a sort of a cosmopolitan and international networks of trade. So uh, apart from that, uh, if you look at this uh, sculpture again, this is of Saint Mark, you know, Saint Mark or Saint Michel of Florence. And Saint Mark is an important uh, evangelist, uh, one of the evangelists and he's represented as an old man here old man who is saint and who is holding a book, maybe it's a Bible. So which tells us his, his sort of a senior uh, seniority, his uh, um, wisdom, and his relation with religion and his, uh, uh, his knowledge. So he's old and look at his beard and the expression. So all this sort of gives a sense of gravity, a sense of heaviness a sense of wisdom to the, a sense of intensity to the entire figure. Again, he's also standing um, in contraposto. As you can see, he's standing on his right leg and the left leg is relaxed. And he's holding the drapery and look at the drapery. The drapery is treated with certain amount of depth, with certain amount of heaviness. And if you look at the hand, the way the hand is positioned, it is very relaxed. The hand is not stiff, it is very relaxed and the relaxed hand that is holding the Bible, that is holding that book and also the drapery in that, in that relaxed leg. And if you look at the other hand, that also looks very relaxed, right? So the entire body posture is very relaxed and that is sort of adding to the calmness of this figure. Right? And this is a freestanding sculpture again, which is placed later in, uh, <clears throat> into the architecture. Donatello has done this uh, equestrian statue. Equ equestrian statue means a uh, statue with the horse. So this is very much influenced by a Roman statue, equestrian statue again of Marcus Aurelius. Mar we have a Roman statue of Marcus Aurelius placed in the center of the city. So this is very much similar to uh, what we see of Marcus Aurelius and it is, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, it is again uh, by Donatello in the, in, in the 15th century, in the mid 15th century. And this is Gatta Meleta, so that Gatta Meleta's uh, uh, statue. And you can see here the twist in the uh, head of the horse, the, one of the legs is lifted up so the, say, the amount of intensity and skill and the skill of modeling uh, is very much evident here. And prominent thing is the influence of the Roman sculpture, right? So let us now move to the another artist called Botticelli. He's a painter and he's known for this particular painting, which is called The Birth of Venus. He's famous for this painting because he it is again like Donatello's David. Venus is represented in nude form for the first time after almost thousand years, you know, after uh, so many years of Christian art. So here, birth of Venus, it's a sort of a, an elegant sort of a, uh, a painting where Venus is standing right in the center, right? 
and Venus, who is Venus? Venus is the Roman goddess of love and beauty, right? And the figure, the couple that you see on the left side is Zephyrus, who is the god of wind and his lover, right? Glorious. And someone who is greeting her on the left side, uh, sorry, on the right side of the canvas of the painting with uh, a robe, you know, nymph greeting Venus with a robe. The nymph, the name of the nymph is Pomona, right? So why is this happening? This is happening because uh, it is a poem written by Angelo Poliziano, right? An Italian poet who is a humanist. He wrote a poem on Venus, on the birth of Venus. So based on the poem, where how the Venus is coming out of the, you know, coming out of the sea and she's standing on the shell, we never have this narrative before, this kind of a painting before. So it is Botticelli who is visualizing based on the poem uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, based on Angelo's poem, okay. So if you look at it, where Venus is standing again in the contraposto, that is the classical posture, Venus is standing on her left leg now and the right leg is relaxed, right? And the figure looks slightly elongated and because of which it looks slightly elegant. And the face, the facial structure and the face is painted really beautifully. There is a sense of beauty and elegance in the face and her hand is resting on her breast. Right? So this is a gesture that we can see used by later artists also. <clears throat> and she is born as if she's coming out from the sea, you know, born from the sea and she's coming out in the shell. And she's welcomed by this nymph on the, on the right where she's giving, offering a robe to her and you have the wind god blowing wind onto her. And along with the wind, he's also blowing some flowers. And it's a very interesting painting. There is a certain kind of a linear quality in terms of drawing and in terms of representing different forms in their crispness. We do not have yet a sense of atmospheric perspective. Uh, we do not have yet an employment of perspective as such, but the organization is sort of arbitrary, just with a certain understanding of painting and understanding of composition. And if you look at the way the waves on the sea is painted, it is very schematic and has an ornamental touch. And the trees on the right side also has this ornamental uh, linear quality of painting. So uh, this is a very important painting which influenced later artists about the imagination of Venus. And this is another painting by uh, Botticelli and this is very interesting for its usage of the architecture. This is the same theme. The theme is Annunciation where the angel comes and discloses the Mary that you know you are going to give birth to a child. <clears throat> so it's, it looks very dramatic. The composition is very dramatic. The figures look very dramatic. We can see that angel is uh, looking as if it just dropped from the sky. just you know, and arrested in that motion. And you have Mary taken aback and she's standing in a posture which is very dramatic. It, it is not very natural. Uh, it, it is as if stage-like, as if they are doing a sort of a ballet or, you know, a sort of a, uh, you know, a musical, not ballet, but musical. Uh, it looks like as if they are make, uh, doing a musical uh, and they are arrested in those postures, right? Uh, so, but if you look at the ambience in which they are organized, they are placed, it is the interior and the interior is very mathematically calculated. Look at the floor and the way the floor is, is, is receding, it helps us to go out and when you go out, visually when you look out, you go out into the landscape. So architecture here is used to kind of open space to go out into the landscape and uh, this helps us and it, it allows our eye to kind of go out and relax, you know. So two ambiences are kind of combined and these doors and windows and, you know, corridors of the architecture so are used to open the space, to open the interior space to the outside and 
when you go out, you have an expanse of landscape. You have the tree right in the center of the frame of the uh, door, which blocks your eye. But when you come down and look at the landscape, you have an expanse of landscape. So enormous amount of space is captured within this small uh, frame of the door. So this is a very interesting technique that we see in, in the Renaissance. And another artist, if we move, when we move, this is Fra Angelico. Fra Angelico is a very promising and very devout artist. Uh, he was himself a very um, uh, intensely uh, embedded in the belief of Christian practice, particularly, of course, Catholic Christianity. So he was also part of a monastery. So this painting that you see is called the naming of St. John the Baptist. So St. John is naming Jesus Christ. It is that episode. So it is like any, uh, you know, you have a saint who is sitting over there and uh, you have, it, it looks like a secular event. It looks like any boy, any boy, newborn boy is carried to this saint and he is naming. It is like any other event. There is no magnanimity about it. There is no... Uh, 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 great effect to it, but it is simple. It is not glorified, but it is sort of simplified, austerized. So this is the quality of Fra Angelico. Fra Angelico sort of compresses things and makes it simple, unlike let us say Masaccio who sort of makes it dramatic, or uh, Botticelli who sort of makes it dramatic. But Fra Angelico makes them more austere, more simple, and more economical when it comes to expression, more simple. So the architecture is also used simply. We do not yet have perspective being used. Uh, it is, the architecture is not following the principles of perspective, but they have, it is painted with arbitrary understanding of perspective. The interesting thing is, look at the way the grass underneath is treated. It looks as if it is a carpet. Right. So, yet we do not. We, there is an attempt to naturalism, but at the same time, we do not have uh, artists achieved so much of naturalism. We have seen some some amount of naturalism being achieved in Masaccio, in Masaccio's paintings. But the other artists uh, were different because you know they did not continue from Masaccio. Masaccio explored something and he happened to have died, but the other artists were painting in their own ways. Maybe they didn't know what Masaccio was doing. So, uh, so this is a very interesting composition. If you look to this painting, uh, the painting again by Fra Angelico called Annunciation, and this is done in San Morocco. It's a fresco and San Morocco monastery in Florence where uh, Fra Angelico used to stay for some time. And if you look at this painting, uh, it's a very interesting composition. It is very different from what we have seen in Botticelli, you know, the dramatic kind of a posturing of the figures. Here it is angel coming from the left side, standing still, straight, and you know, announcing, disclosing to the Mary. Mary is very small here. She is looking very thin. She is not dramatic. She is trying to kind of take that shock of the news slowly and, you know, uh, it is this, she's lower than the angel. She's, you know, in terms of when you look at them, angel, uh, angel is uh, taller than Mary. So it shows that she's receiving it, she's taking it. And at the back you have one person standing who is looking like a saint, could be the artist or the patron saint of San Morocco uh, Monastery, uh, San Marco Man Monastery. So if you look at it, it's a very interesting composition, very austere. You don't have dramatic light. You have simple light. You don't have dramatic opening of the architecture. But there is a sense of harmony here. There is a sense of rational treatment of pictorial space. There is a rationality in terms of the calculatedness about uh, the composition. If you look at the uh, way they are bending, towards each other, you know, the way the Mary is bending as well as the angel is slightly bent and the wings of the angel, you know, this bent uh, that they have created is sort of echoed and carried uh, ahead by the arch, you know, that you have, the arches that you have uh, in the architecture, you know, this kind of a round uh, form at the 
in the in the top portion so this kind of creates a sense of harmony you know and a sort of a rationalized pictorial space and the kind of volumetric modeling of forms with light and shadow so it is very precise very uh, rationalized this is another painting by Frangelico same theme but it is slightly different slightly sort of animated rather than the earlier one where the angel is entering uh, into the cloister and look at the uh, arc that is making uh, that is made by the uh, wings of the angel very beautifully painted uh, uh, wings and it is the angel has just arrived and then it is closing and Mary here is not so small but she is sitting on uh, on the table and Mary if she just imagine if she stands if she stands she would look bigger than angel if she stands she cannot fit in the entire architecture right so it is very interesting it is not rational different from the earlier one so if Mary stands in this particular ambience where she is sitting she would hit the roof she is so tall right and angel is just coming and disclosing and she the entire setup is placed in this architecture filled with Roman arches and Roman columns and on the left side you see the grass is represented and the foliage is represented which is very ornamental the grass looks like almost like a carpet so this is another painting again in the same San Marco for, uh, monastery <coughs> uh, but the same theme but there is a slight difference and very important difference um, not slight but quite some difference when it look when you look at the painting and if you go back right behind the Mary um, there is a small opening like door and then from that door you have a small window which shows the foliage from the back so here he is slightly opening not dramatic like Botticelli but he's slightly opening the architecture to sort of you know create multiple ambiences <coughs> so we have seen the early uh, Renaissance the Renaissance in its early part uh, so how the artists are dealing and you know opening up the pictorial space how to give us more experience of the space how to create that naturalistic appeal of the space so within that the humanization of you know Christian themes are happening the human you know the Christian figures the Christian themes are represented in the human bodies almost with the emotions and the reactions and the responses so Renaissance the early Renaissance uh, we can see architecture is become becoming more important in the painting and the humanization uh, of the Christian theme the, almost the Christ is coming down to the earth and he's becoming human and experiencing the human emotions so this is the kind of early part of Renaissance that we have seen